getting started here. Get my microphone and see if I'm actually streaming. Yeah, it looks like me. Okay, excellent. Let's get rid of that. Don't need to see it. So if you are just joining us, welcome. <clears throat> if you're looking at this in the future, um, type in the chat what it's like. Do we have flying cars? Uh, today, we are going to practice a whole bunch of hard stuff and some maybe more normal stuff. I need to practice a couple of things for my students' lessons, but I also just wanted to get back into some other things that I really just have not done in a long time. And uh, one of my students is playing a piece that I know pretty well, but I'd like to do it on my French Besson and talk about that a little bit. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I'm going to definitely need lots of questions today, and I'll be asking for them throughout the stream. So if you're uh, joining up uh, right now, if you can think of some questions, that would really help me out a lot. I'm also going to try to be better about taking breaks today because I'm super bad at that on stream. I try to be uh, constantly engaging and at least doing something because that's more entertaining, I think. But maybe it's best, best if I am a better example to my students and to my potential future students and to my colleagues and uh, their students as well. Uh, I, that's the point of this stream, right, is to show off good practice habits and not resting enough is one of the major bad ones that we all have. So anyway, um, let's see. So I'm not, I don't know exactly where to start. Uh, I suppose we can, we can start with some of these mutes behind me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get our top 50 book out. Let me get my, yeah, there we go. I'll get my top 50 book out and I'm going to look up Debussy, and we're going to do Fets right now, which, oh, look, it was bookmarked by Bizet. I don't know why Bizet is there, but anyway, Debussy, okay. And this is uh, an excellent excerpt to, to learn, especially if you're, if you're learning, um, well, of course you need to know Debussy in general, but uh, it's a trio as opposed to just a, like a, an excerpt that you might learn the solo from. This is a trumpet trio, and it's really, really just, uh, uh, it's exciting to listen to in the orchestra. Uh, there's, there's sort of some percussion in the background, but it's mostly just this trio that's sort of uh, representing an army kind of marching forward, right? Uh, I, I don't know that it's actually programmatic that way, but... That's kind of what, the way that we see it is just it's the, it's coming closer and closer and closer and it it's going to get here soon. And if you listen to the whole piece, you'll you'll hear what what I mean by that. Um, now, in this top 50 book, uh, he suggests uh, Wispa or Practice Mute or Harmon with Stem Pulled and Interior Stuffed with Cotton or Cloth. Uh, I have not used any of those. Uh, I know for for sure a Practice Mute is going to be too soft. I can get one, though. Let's do that. While we're, while we're at it, so to speak, right, let me put this down and I'll go get a practice mute. And we've got Harmon and I don't have it stuffed with cloth. But uh, let's see if I have anything around here that could substitute. No, not really. Really supposed to put really supposed to put cotton balls in inside a lot of the mutes. So anyway, we're going to, we're going to get playing here a little bit. So here's, here's what we're looking for. It says it's, it's got to be this sort of distant sound uh, in order for it to seem like it's getting closer. Right. And you do it, you do it once with mutes. And then when you turn the page, you do it without mutes and, uh, then it, then it sort of concludes in this very Debussyan fashion uh, of these these kind of colorful half step ridden lines. Um, so uh, let, let's just hear the trumpet without it. You know, you shouldn't practice excerpts without a mute if they have a mute. But if you're not sure what the mutes are going to sound like, uh, and just for the the effect on the stream, um, I thought that I would uh, just show you what the trumpet sounds like without any of these mutes. Oh, hi. 
Hello, Fastro, uh, from Twitch, rather. Um, good to see you. All right, so. So there's just normal trumpet sound, right? Just roughly good. And on this excerpt, Okay, so now we're, we're looking to make that sound more distant, but we, we still want it to have some brightness. So we're going to try the things he said first, and then we'll get into the things that I would suggest. Uh, so this is practice mute. I don't have a, a, an official wisp of mute, but this is, a, this is a, a practice practice mute. So as you can hear, barely, that is not very loud. And if you were to play this in an orchestra, they'd never hear you in a million years. I mean, you may as well be in another uh, country. So um, this is the sh mute. Um, this one is a little bit louder for practice, as far as practice mute goes. And they do make a sh mute that is for playing on stage with a wisp of mute, a bas basically a performance practice mute. Uh, this is not it. I thought this. I thought I had one, but I, I guess I guess I don't. So it has way more presence, but it's very Harmon kind of sounding uh, for a mute, right? So. Uh, that's two of the mutes, right? Those are the two that he... Uh, we didn't do Harmon with the stem pulled, though, right? Oh, look, I think you're you're signed on to both accounts. Look at you. Giving me double views. I'll take it. So here's a Harmon mute. This is actually a uh, Wawa Dual is the name of this uh, Stone Lines mute. They made a bunch of different Harmon-type mutes. Uh, I really like this one for... Um, for jazz and for certain pieces in classical repertoire. I believe I had this one out for the Halsey Stevens. So that's, that's what I was doing. Maybe we'll practice Halsey Stevens today. I don't have it out, but so let's, let's hear what this one sounds like. Um, I guess I'll, play, I'll keep playing the same passage. It sounds like a Harmon mute to me. So I, d I don't quite, I don't think that's what Debussy was going for. Well, I, I could say I'm pretty sure because I don't think the Harmon mute existed when this piece uh, was written, right? So it's not, it's not likely that he meant for you to use that kind of mute. So he wanted it muted though, right? He wants muted, to, to many people muted means softer. And to trumpet, that's not guaranteed to be the case, right? I can use this mute, for instance, this is a, 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 a traditional uh, aluminum straight mute. This is a very good one, a trump core. Uh, the, these play so super open, right? And I can play, if I play just kind of medium loud, if I don't change anything about the way I played, It's about the same volume, which is a mark of a very well-balanced, well-made mute uh, that's not supposed to do anything to your volume, right? That's what this, this mute doesn't change the volume, it just changes the timbre. And so with that in mind, this is the first, this is the, the kind of my first attempt at a good mute for this, right? Uh, I have two other mutes behind me that I would use uh, over this one probably, but, but this is a good mute if, if you had to actually play a lot of different things um, uh, all, all over the, oh, it's my, it's the CDC wants to know if I'm okay. And I am, but I'll check in later. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, so th this is a good all around mute. If you have to play very, uh, medium loud to, to loud, 
and all the way down to pretty soft. This mute will do all of that. Uh, the other mutes that we're going to try won't go super loud. Uh, this one only goes so loud, and then you want the heavier brass bottom or copper bottom ones because they hold up a little bit better. But this is a really great all-around mute uh, for orchestra or for solo work. So, but I have to play softly, right? That's the point I'm trying to make. So. This is a pretty good mute for this. Uh, I guess I'll keep it out because I don't know what I had it out for. Um, now this is this is a mute that a lot of people will play. I just bought this one. I haven't used it very much. Normally you'd stuff it with cotton balls, but since they're sort of hard to get out once you put them in there, I haven't decided to do that yet. I haven't played with this much. So now we're go we're going to just play the same thing. All right. <clears throat> Right, this this mute has some color to it, but it sounds more distant, I think, than the than the metal straight mute, and that's pr quite frankly because of the material. Right, this is a uh, uh, ABS plastic, I believe, and it has a very large open hole. Which th this you'd, you'd think this would matter more. It does, but it also matters where it shows up in the bell. Right, if it's way up in super deep deep in the bell and it has a big wide opening, that's different than if it's way down here and has a big opening, and also vice versa, if it's down here and has a small opening, that, that changes a lot of things. And so a lot of mutes are built with that in mind. All the good ones are taking that into account. All right, so now this is the mute that I actually would play it on, I think. Like I said, I've never, I haven't used that other mute. Now this mute is extremely sharp, so it's hard to, like, you can't really take it out and then play open again. But as long as you get to leave it in, like you do here, you can play. So this, what is this? This is a Tom Crown. This is the first one that's not really a real mute. Uh, this is a Tom Crown uh, aluminum with, uh, without any of the normal corks on it. And instead, my dad did this when I was uh, a teenager. He just put a cork on either side from a sheet, a sheet, sheet cork the, for you get at the hardware store. And it sort of makes like a almost harm and it has these gaps on the sides here, right? And so... Oh, I got a bunch of comments. Oh, Mo Montreal mute. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't. I have the uh, the Chicago. I think I don't think I, I have the Montreal. I'll I'll go. I'll I'll get in the cabinet. We'll try some more. Hey, Dad. Um, so that you made this mute. So this is my this is my go to. It has all of the brassiness that the metal straight does, right? But it has even more of the distance that we get from this. Right? It's even further away. It's probably most closely related to this guy here. Uh, 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 Michael wants to know, where do you try mutes? And I have bad news for you, Michael. Um, you, well, the first news is you should try them, right? Which you're already, you've already said that. Uh, you should definitely try mutes before you buy them because they are different. No matter what the guy at, behind the booth tells you, even if he says, no, all my mutes are exactly the same, they play the same, I make sure of that because I play them. Okay, well, that's great. You know, let me see your resume. What gigs do you play? Do you, do you have the same exact sensibility that, that I'm looking for in terms of how I play the trumpet? And No. 
it, I'm going to play differently than anybody. Even if we are, you know, uh, even if he plays gigs at a higher level than I do, I might be looking for something different uh, than than he is when he makes the mutes, right? So I always want to try the mute and make sure that it plays the way that I, let's say that I expect it to play or that I want it to play, or just the best one of the bunch, right? If there's 10 mutes, I want to try all of them and pick the one that plays the best. And even if it's all in my mind, it's going to make me feel better about my purchase. And the guy behind the booth still makes the money. So, you know, I, I, I've done this every time. The answer to your question, though, is uh, at ITG and NTC, those are great places because they, the people who make really good mutes are all there. And they uh, are, they're all, especially at those conferences, the, the, it's the real person that, uh, that actually makes them a lot of times. And they're very nice people to, to talk to and work with. And they're happy to have you try all the mutes and buy them. And uh, they'll say, they, they, you know, they, they know that it's good for business to let you pick what you want and then you're going to send people to them later, right? So um, one, ex one excellent example is Trump Corps, the guy that makes them, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, I'm sorry to say, but uh, he's, he's very, very nice uh, uh, and just makes incredible mutes and he keeps innovating. He, he used to only make these, oh, I, I skipped one. This is a really good, the lyric one is almost... Uh, Taylor made for this. Well, let's see. We'll play the second half now. Right. So this this has a lot of really interesting color changeability that I like very much. It's just it's a it's not quite metallic enough sounding because it's not made of metal. It's this is a balsa wood mute and cardboard. Um, I, uh, it's not quite metallic enough for the sound I'm looking for in this excerpt, but I use this mute. This is my first go-to mute for soft stuff. So, uh, we could try some other ones. Um, oh, I wonder if my sister is here. If she is, she can be, uh, she can kill this bot that, uh, wants in. I'm not actually logged into either Twitter or YouTube, so I can't, I can't kill the bots, but let me go get some more mutes. I'm going to, I'm going to put some away. And then uh, I guess I could, maybe I can switch your guys' view also. Yeah, look at that. So now, uh, let's see, we'll put, what mutes will we put away? We'll put away these ones that we didn't like. We need this one out. And uh, we'll put away this one because we kind of did better than that. And now you can see the, uh, these, are the, these are the mutes, right? Don't look at all, this is all just gig clothes. But, uh, yeah, so we've got, where's my soft, oh, there's the Montreal, uh, okay. So this is the area, so this is the, I, I thought this was the Chicago, but Dad, you can tell me, the brown, the brown cardboard one with a, uh, a, I think, balsa bottom. And then this one, this one is the Soda Voce, this is a Hickman thing. Uh, this has carpet all over it. And it's otherwise made out of cardboard as well. And, well, what the heck, we'll, we'll look at this one too. This is a, oh, I forget the name of this company. Uh, but this one, I lost the other bunch of the set. Uh, I left it on a gig and they threw it away. It was actually a Great American Brass Band Festival. And uh, I had this, uh, the set that goes with this that replaced the that really good cut mute. Uh, that you have, Dad, that um, I can't remember. Anyway, so let's try these. Yes, I know I'm quiet. I couldn't help it. Um, right, okay. What are we doing? Playing, playing Fats some more. Uh, okay, let's start with this one. Uh, let me flip the camera. Bam. Uh, so this is whatever that company is. I can't remember. And I, uh, of course the sticker fell off. This is, um, uh, I got it from Phil Parker in London and the, they, they were very nice and sent it to me, uh, along with the rest of the mutes from that company. But basically there, it, one was a copy of this mute, but, um, in, in ABS plastic. So it was a little less expressive, but it held together better. Uh, one was, uh, the 
a copy of this kind of mute with the, uh, with the, the green uh, felt on the inside. And now this trump core has this one now. And, uh, and then this was the third one, which was the, the triangle. So So it has a nice distant sound, but it's very smoky and kind of like, I don't know, airy. I don't like it so much. It's also missing some corks you can see. I need to recork it, but it came that way in the mail and I just never bothered because I never really liked it. Um, here is the Chicago or Montreal, we don't know, whichever one it is. Right? That's pretty good. It's a little bit nasally, actually. It doesn't have as much depth as the metal one. You don't want to put it too far in on these. That's really flat, boy. So yeah, this is nice. I mean, it's, it's very distant. It doesn't have the brightness that I would necessarily be going for, but I would put this in the bag for when the conductor says, no, no, too bright, oh, awful. Then I just, oh, okay, sorry, maestro. Now I'm ready, right? Just play the same. It's good to have a few mutes. Uh, if, you're, if you're watching this and you're thinking, uh, yeah, Peter Gain, that's what it was, yeah. Um, Peter Gain, yeah. Um, but the, but the company wasn't Peter Gain. They, were caught, they bought the patent to the Peter Gain mute and, uh, and they made them, I, I wish I could remember. I have to look on Phil Parker's website. They probably still have them. If they don't, it's a shame and I will never know because the, the labels all fell off. They weren't very well glued together, mutes, but the designs were good and the, the plastic parts were great. Um, but yeah, so if you're watching this and you're like, Gabriel, you own so many mutes. Why, why would you have, for instance, uh, six different straight mutes that you like for this gig, right? Uh, it's, uh, it, I think it's obvious, but in, unless you've never thought of it, right? If you just think, well, it says straight mute, you put a straight mute in. Now that, that works in you know, middle school and high school band, uh, and maybe even partially through college, but a lot of times, especially you st starts in college, you start getting the hand all the time when it's muted because the composers think that muted means softer a lot but as we've already discussed it doesn't and so then you get the hand but you're muted but now you're now your production is bad and you, you know you, you haven't spent enough time on your soft playing and so now you're uh, you're not playing the trumpet very well mechanically uh, but you can't play any softer but you keep getting the hand and it's really high and you know mutes are your absolute best friend they're your savior Especially if it's not a school thing where like you're obligated to that ensemble and they're just going to give you a grade at the end, but it's a gig where they're going to fire you forever and never hire you again if you just can't get this thing, right? Uh, it's really nice to just have, I'm, I've brought, uh, people make fun of me, but I've brought whole big bags of, I mean like a trash bag size bag of mutes to a gig where I didn't know the conductor yet. And, uh, and I hadn't maybe played in that hall. And I, I literally just bring almost every straight mute I have. And it makes a big clunky sound. It sounds like I'm recycling cans when I show up at the gig. And I plunk it down next to me and I open it up, right? And I get out the mute that I think is gonna work and the second mute that I think might, might be a little bit better depending. And I put those out. And then we, then we get to that part in the piece and I do my best to try to play the way I think it should go, and then I wait. And if the conductor says, oh, I don't like that sound, or, oh, that's, you know, and I mean, nine times out of 10, they don't say anything because it was fine. But that one time out of 10 uh, comes around pretty often if you have enough gigs, right? And you're really happy that you had six other choices. And every time they choose the last thing I would have chosen, they're like, oh, that's nice. I like that smoky sound. You're like, that's not what this is supposed to sound like but it is to them and that's, they're in charge. You don't get to decide, right? 
Uh, so somebody, we had a master class with Joe Bowman yesterday, and he was quoting, I think, Vacchiano. And he said, like, you know, he, Vacchiano used to say, nobody, nobody ever paid me to have an opinion. You know, and that's kind of true. So, uh, yeah, you just have to do the job, and you have to be uh, uh, versatile enough and have the tools to be versatile enough to actually be able to do exactly the job you're being asked. And you might think, well, that's not fair. How are you supposed to know? Well, it's not fair, but somebody else is that prepared. And so they're going to get all the, the work and you're not going to get any of it. So it's, it's, a, it's sort of more uh, thinking about you want to be prepared enough to do any job. And uh, you can just be a super great trumpet player and have one or two mutes that kind of get the job done. But uh, I mean, how great is that? to be able to control the color independent of pitch and not miss notes on a mute that's not really that great for the job. Um, I'm just not that good a trumpet player. So I just have a bunch of mutes instead. And it's not an excuse. It's I, I try to be the best trumpet player I can. I just don't think I'm ever going to be good to, good enough to make a, uh, you know, a, a standard band, uh, uh, aluminum band mute uh, sound right for this excerpt, for instance. So sometimes you really do need better tools. Um, Anyway, all right. So that's enough of that. We've got plenty. Uh, we've got plenty of mutes. We tr we we messed with this excerpt enough. I will I will just go on to say I'm going to use the mute I like. I will just go on to say that um, the the trick to this excerpt, since my student who is doing this f for his lessons is watching, the trick to this excerpt really is about pre subdivision and. Uh, this was also something that got talked about at the master class yesterday, that you you have to be uh, anticipating, right? What what did he say exactly? Let's see if I have my notes about it nearby. But uh, that that you know, trumpet playing is hard work. Uh, but that you, oh, what did he say? Let's see if I can get it. Yeah, I don't know. I know where I wrote it down, but I can't find it now. Uh, well, but basically that you're, that you're always, you're always prepared for what's coming, right? That you're, that you're doing the work in advance, right? And that's what we want here, except instead of physical work about like really playing with more air on the lower note, let's say, or something like that, uh, we're talking about having the subdivision. I, I learned this in the, uh, 2002 masterclass, uh, at ITG in Denver, and it was uh, Mike Sachs, and he, it was a beautiful master class. I talk about it all the time, but he did this excerpt, and I just thought it was amazing. So he, what he does is he subdivides the thing before he needs the subdivision, and he does that literally in this excerpt. So I can do that um, a little bit here. So your first subdivision comes before you even breathe, right? You want Da, 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 da. That's, an, that's a 16th note. I know you're not looking at the music, but you can get this pretty easily online. Uh, WC, F E T E S, FETS. Uh, and so you're going. So you're always thinking ahead to that next subdivision and you're subdividing the note before it the same way mentally. That's what you have to do. And you have to be able to do that metronomically, absolutely, perfectly. So a lot of it comes down to these, right? Making sure those snap hard enough and are not uh, real lilty like the triplets you just played because they're, 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 dotted 16th note, 32nd notes versus a triplet over the same beat. So that's what you have to be careful of. All right, that's enough of this. Uh, I, I don't have a specific plan for today in order. Um, so we might come back to some excerpts. But uh, I thought since it's the same person's lesson, we do a little Scarlatti Biche, or Biche Scarlatti, as I keep trying to get myself to say. Because Biche wrote this, which is variations on a theme by Scarlatti. 
Um, and that would be the right way to say that. So uh, what, well, I, I don't think we've done this piece on the stream. And that's a shame because it's a really nice piece. Um, and I think I should just play some of it, but I wanted to do it on the French Besson because, well, I think that this is a nice trumpet for it. Uh, it's, this, this trumpet has a lot of color change ability. Uh, it's not very well in tune, so I don't think I would necessarily play it uh, in, in public on this trumpet, but it's a, good, it's a good trumpet to try to play it on and learn from. And because it's, this has some sort of compactness to it, the way that it plays um, as, a, as a prototype, so to speak, of the modern trumpet, it has some problems that the modern trumpets don't have. But those problems are not problems in the traditional sense. They, they're, it's more like the modern trumpets that we play are making up for some bad habits that we all seem to have. And it makes sense, right? Like on, on cars, uh, if, you're, if everybody is a little bit inattentive at driving, it's going to mean some accidents, right? But if your car automatically adjusts when it notices that you're at the edge of the road, or if it automatically slows down when you approach an oncoming car the way that they do now, uh, well, then you're going to save lives. And if all the cars have that, and you've never driven a car without that, you're going to have maybe different habits than you would if uh, you had driven a car that had none of those safety features. So I'm very glad for the safety features on cars, and I'm very glad for uh, modern trumpets. But if you drive, uh, well, like my sister drives a motorcycle, there is no extra safety features. I mean, they do have them, but for motorcycles, but I mean, compared to cars, they're not even even close to safe because of the cars, not because of the motorcycle drivers, right? And so you have to be way more aware of your surroundings, of the road conditions, of all that stuff. And so in a lot of ways, this is very much like, like uh, driving the same road on a motorcycle. And then when you get your car, uh, it, everything's a lot easier, um, but maybe you don't have quite as much uh, agility, uh, so to speak. So that's my best analogy. And uh, excuse for me to rest. So here we go. We're going to play some Scarlatti. I'm going to play it from beginning to end because it's a, a variations, right? So I want you to hear the theme that we're, that we're variating. Is that, a, is that a real word, variate, variate? Yeah, we'll go with it. You can tell me in the chat what the real word is for to vary. I guess vary. I just said it. All right, and we're going to play, in case you're interested at all, there's only three of you, but some of you might be trumpet players. Uh, this is, like I said, the French Besson. This is about 19, uh, 10, 11, something like that. And this is my uh, Bach straight eight with a, with a screw rim, which was probably, this is probably around 1938, 1942, somewhere around there. 1940, we'll call it. So, all right, let's see. piece to do it that slow on but if you go too fast at the beginning the other variations don't make nearly as much sense now they do vary tempo to tempo but so now we get into the real stuff um, 
variation one, it's actually easier for us to play than the pianists. So you have to be careful here that you don't try to go too fast. I like to go, but the, the pianists have to go, and it's, it's not an easy lick for them. They have to do it in octaves, and they're not very kind octaves to the pianist. Some really, the, I'm, I'm thinking of the Hoken Hardenberger recording or the Alan Vizzuti recording, both of which go pretty fast, but the pianists on those albums both are incredible pianists. And it's not that the people that I've worked with aren't also incredible, but you know they weren't getting ready for a recording of... Uh, like a, a, a pristine recording of it either, right? So there's some limit to the amount that they're probably going to have time for my pieces, right? They've got a million things to do. Um, so you have to be, you have to think of that if you're going to play this at like, the last time I played it was at a day camp for a, trump, a brass day camp, a trumpet day camp actually. And, you know, it was, it went fine, but I had to go way slower. So uh, be, be prepared. Now let's see. Do I want to keep playing this mouthpiece? It feels bad, but let's let's keep trying. <clears throat> Varying, yes. Um. Huh. Uh, it's not very accurate. Let's go slower. So it's about, if you tongue too hard, it's too plosive and you get random results. Uh, if you, also if you tongue too hard, you back off your air just temporarily and then you miss notes going down. That's what I've been doing. Let's try the second one. The other thing I wrote for myself here is long 16th. Um, they don't need to be short until the piano part. And even then, they don't have to be really much shorter. But I try to make sure I'm not I'm not cutting off all the notes with my tongue. I went da 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 da. Right. See, that sounds fat. That sounds short. But I'm I played them as long as I could. All right. All right. Long. Long is the way to go, because the, the attack will be there if your air is there. All right, uh, let's try to actually, that's a pretty good tempo. Let's see what 84 actually is, because I, I worked this all out with a metronome, and then like I said, I can't go that fast. Yeah, this is, that's almost where we're at, so we're not going to worry about it too much. I'll spend all day on this piece if you let me, so, so I'm not going to let myself. Not great. I started to get ta -ta 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 right there long I think long on those downward ones so I didn't stop on the first one even though it was bad why because it's a really easy habit to get into to play suck stop start again play better think about going on maybe try one more time now it's good go on what that does while it's good to go back for things that you've missed and not ingrain you want to ingrain bad habits but actually think about what you're doing there you're ingraining the habit that you get it wrong once, you get it almost right again, and then you get it right. And if you do that every time, it's okay to do that once, right? It's okay to do that maybe a couple times in the week. But if you do that every time you try it, which is what I'll do if I let myself, then I've ingrained that that part, I get three tries at that part. And so, of course, it never goes well under pressure the first time. Maybe it would go great if I got three tries at it, but guess what you don't get in a live performance? So 
I try to just go through it even if it sucks. And then what does that mean for me? Well, the first one is bad because I'm not really ready to do this Petrushka lick, right? Uh, I just played the wrong fingering there, but uh, I, I, need to go, I need to go a little slower and just really feel like I've got the coordination and that I'm ready for it, right? Then I'm not just going, oh no, right, and tightening up as I go, but that I'm actually prepared for the, the highest part of this lick on the lowest part, right? That was so much better, right? And it sounds easier because it's easier, right? That's almost the tempo I want. Let's see if we can go a little faster. Uh, not as accurate. That's better, right? And I should probably use a metronome, but uh, I just want to get a couple of shots at it. And you got to think too, if I miss one note, that's really not a big deal. Most people won't even notice in concert. Uh, but if I stop on it because I hate that I missed it and I get down about it and, you know, uh, sort of, uh, sh shade on myself, right, then I'm going to, something bad is going to happen. Either I'm going to try too hard now to try to get that note, or I'm going to think, well, I can never, I'm never going to get that, right, or some other negative thought that I just don't need. Um, also, it's worth, worth, worth mentioning and thinking about that you're going to need to show your tempo as you come in, because this isn't really the easiest lick to hear the tempo in, right? Is... There's a lot of rhythm, but none of it's really super clear if you're not sure of what it is. So again, when you're playing with a pianist, you want to at least show and. Die, 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 die. That way they know where one is, one is, one is, and then they can come in right when they need to, right? So I'm practicing that. over and over, I guess. But now you might notice uh, when I accent, I rush. I noticed at that time I just kept going because I didn't want to stop every time I get something wrong. I want to go a little past it maybe. But here's the spot. Oh boy. That's not the right rhythm. I just want to get myself out of the habit. And this is hard to go to make that short and not just long for the for the repeated notes. But that's something I also I might I might just work on that separately on the, in the Arbenz book or something, right? So now, if you think this movement is bad, uh, keep watching uh, for more bad, bad, uh, bad licks, right? We're about to come up on the one that I literally can't get. So stay tuned for more uh, failure on, on, on the on B. Scarlatti variations. Um, uh, now, it's in this next variation, as a matter of fact. Uh, but I don't know if you're, you're noticing this already, but can you hear how, like, if I play this horn right, it works marvelously if i try to overblow it or if i try to do something um too too caveman too kludgy then it punishes me right away and that's what i like about it right i want when i when i go to my normal mouthpiece on my normal trumpet and i do all the same stuff it's only going to be more um it's only going to be more efficient and it'll give me a little bit of that el elbow room for error that I might need in a performance situation or just when I'm trying to interface with the accompanist or maybe in a different piece when I'm trying to be in tune with the other trumpet player or, you know, whatever it is, right? Uh, to Ted, this is the, um, this is Variations on a Theme by Scarlatti uh, by 
by Biche. And it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. My favorite recording, uh, there's two really. Uh, there's the, uh, on, on the At the Beach album, I believe it is, of uh, Hoken Hardenberger, which I hear is available again. Uh, and it might even be on Spotify now. And that's, that's the one I grew up really listening to a lot. The other one is, I believe, on the Carnival of Venus of uh, Al Vizzuti. Uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that. I don't know what album it's on. Because um, <clears throat> I've only listened to it when it was on my whole hard drive. Because uh, like, I had this hard drive going when I got that CD. So I just put it right in and never you know, used it in a CD player. Um, uh, but, but yeah, the, the Vizzuti is also good. And then there's also, uh, another one that I, I like almost as much. Um, Ole Edward Antitson did this as well. And they're all three just extremely great technicians. Uh, I, like I said, I'm partial to the Hokan one because that's the one I know the best, but, uh, Vizzuti's is also equally great. And his fourth variation is just unbelievable. And then Ole, uh, Ole Edward Antitson, his playing is so precise. He plays short notes like nobody else I've ever heard. And um, so I especially like those variations, like the one we're about to do. So, so yeah, there you go. Uh, so this is variation two. That was variation one. Now this one, the pianist can tend to play really... It's, it's odd, odd, actually. It's the same lick. Like they play things that sound like you, but in octaves. So you go... And they go... You know, it's back and forth. It's a, it's a perfect trade-off. Um, but for some reason they can play this one really fast. So I don't know what's idiomatic on piano. I don't play piano very well, but, but so this one, you have to be prepared to go fast as opposed to the last one. Uh, here we go. Oh boy. There we go. I hate this entrance. I keep playing my A's third valve. I don't think that's a good choice on this horn anymore. I'm going to try to stop doing that. I did it again. Ah, that's why I do it. It's really sharp. Let me just pull it a little more. So this is another thing where you can tut tongue all these and as long as you keep your support going that's okay but when you go as fast as you're probably going to go uh a ta is a much better tonguing and it keeps the air going better so then your support is natural as opposed to forced right so I think it's better to do ta tonguing on these even though they have the same accent mark as the short notes we had from the last variation um the piano actually makes it sound shorter because they, they have this very easy off kind of the uh, uh, sh staccato on a piano is a very known sound and they're very good at it. So because you're matching the line with the piano, you can actually get away with a little more length as long as you have good fronts, right? So that's, that's what I have to say about this. Let's see if we can put it. Well, we haven't finished. found the high B that I never can play. I don't know what it is about it. It's not that high. It's just all of the stuff around it. Uh, there's something wrong with what I do. And let's maybe figure it out today or maybe leave it alone if we can't, right? And play the rest of the piece, but... Um. So there's the, there's the note. That's super slow. It needs to go... Right? Maybe if I accent on the where it says to accent, maybe that will help me. Let's see. Yeah, sort of. It's kind of cacked still, right? Can you hear it? 
That's what usually happens. It's actually better. So I don't know if you can tell. I play better when I hold my right hand against the horn this way. So I'm, uh, I don't know what you can see there. I, uh, so I, it looks bad for my fingers because they flop over the valves like this. But um, it's not so much where my fingers go. It's actually where this thumb goes that's important to me. And the reason this is, is uh, I, when you put all your pressure on with your left hand, then you push it this way, right? You sort of push it to the right. Uh, or so, so you're putting more pressure on the left side of your embouchure, right? The left side of your mouthpiece. Because that's the left side, right? Of course, that's, that's just mechanics. So a lot of people will try to, you know, they'll push their hand in there further. But that's still, that's, that you, can, you can get a little more leverage, but um, it's, it's still going to be the same problem. You're still going to pull the, the tail end of the horn to the left, which pulls the mouthpiece across and to the right. So what I like to do is stabilize that with my thumb on the brace here, which is a good place to touch anyway because it doesn't dampen the lead pipe. It doesn't dampen the bell any more than the brace already is, right? And uh, then I can, I can sort of keep the pressure. Now, now I have a way to push back to the right, uh, sorry, back from the right, right? So from right to left and now, so now I'm pulling this way, I'm pushing this way and I can keep the pressure even, right? So that's not, that's not super important for most people, but for me and stuff like this, it really is. And it's because of my dentition. It's because my bottom teeth aren't even. And so when I push too hard on the left side instead of the right side, I don't have the agility that I do if it's even pressure. So uh, let's see what we can do with this. Uh, it was okay. I still missed the high B, right? But I'd rather not dwell on it. So let's see if we can play this whole movement. Uh, I haven't finished it off, I guess. a good example. This horn makes me really dig into that low C. I can't just flab, flab into it. That's better. So, all right. Since there are eight of you, which is a, a, a record, I think. Um, that's not true. We had 16 once, but that was when people were playing, not just practicing. Um, if somebody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them because doing this kind of stuff constantly is a, is a uh, great way to build bad habits. So I want to rest a little bit. I'm even going to take some water. I keep forgetting to do that too. Um, we only have two variations left of this piece and I'll probably skip most of the third variation. Uh, not because it's not great. It's, it's actually my favorite one, but because it, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of, long notes and I want to practice a little longer. I don't really need to practice the third variation very much. I know it pretty well. Uh, but what I don't want to do is waste my chops on it today. And this maybe is a different thing to talk about. Um, is it varying now that I'm thinking about it, Dad? Varying, like making variations of a thing I guess it is varying, but varying seems like you're, you're just changing. I guess it is the same word. It's the same root word for sure. But I wonder if there's a, re, a, a way to say like, like the way that you would say fuguing, for instance, right? Like variationing. Uh, I bet there's a word that some musicologists made up and then made into the lexicon. Those guys are always, that's one of the things about musicology that I really like that, uh, I wish that they would let us get away with other places where they make up words that really make sense. And they, I mean, they do their research, you know, they have the right Latin root and they make up a word that's never been said or heard or written before for their composer that they're the scholar on for the type of music that they make, that that person makes. And everybody just says, yeah, that's cool. I understand. 
And then everybody uses that word after that. Why can't we all do that? Why can't I make up words like that? So I just do it anyway. I, my students all know I say all kinds of crazy words. And after you study with me for a year or two, you know all my crazy words. And then you think those are normal words. I try to make sure that they know, hey, if you say this outside of the uh, ECU, people are going to go, what? What are you talking about? That's not a real word. And you can just explain to them what it means. But it's probably better if you just, you know, say it in normal terms. Um, but it saves a lot of time in lessons, especially since I will talk too much in lessons anyway. It's nice to save some time somewhere. So, yeah, right? It's, it's got to be, there's got to be a word. I bet, I, I'm trying to think of what era of scholarship would have the word for vari making variations. Uh, I feel like it'd probably be classical, right? Somebody who writes on classical music, because that's kind of where we get a lot of variations coming in. Um, and there might, there might be a treatise actually from like a CPE Bach kind of era treatise that says like, this is what the process of making variations looks like, you know, something like that. I, I should know more about this. You know, I was just thinking about this. I don't actually know when we started doing theme and variations specifically. I don't think we did any in Baroque, but I could be wrong about that. I do know that we have some classical examples, and for sure, middle of the uh, middle of the cl uh, classical era or sort of classical interromantic, we have we start to have cornet variations in popular music. So that's for sure happening in the early romantic, late classical. But I think we I think uh, because of rondo form, I think we have theme and variations pretty early in the classical era, and so. But I yeah, that I just was thinking about the other day. You know, uh, there's, uh, this is one of those things, right, where there's so much that you don't know that it's really hard to, you, I mean, I feel guilty about things that I realized I didn't know uh, and, and, and had every opportunity to look up and just didn't, right? Um, morphing. Morphing is good. Um, you know, the, the uh, uh, yesterday, for instance, like I've played the Tartini before, Um Joe Bergstahl gave us a master class yesterday, uh, and he asked my student, who might still be on stream, um, what do you know about Tartini? And as soon as he asked that question, I had like a mild panic attack because I went, well, I don't know anything about Tartini, so I don't know why I would expect Michael to. Uh, and it just, we've been talking about trumpet playing things and, it, you know, style things, but, and of course, yes, we want we do want to get to that level where we are we understand the composer and where he's from and what he's up to and all about his life. But you know, Joe just knows that stuff, and uh, because he studied it, I mean, he didn't just wasn't just born knowing it, right? Uh, but he's all he always does that step. He always looks that up, and not everybody does it. I'm one of those not everybody's, right? I I don't always do it uh, the way that I should and know as much as I can about the composer. Or if I did know it, I forget it, and then I don't look it back up when I start playing their piece. And that's a big mistake, because sometimes it's really informative. And even if it's not, it's really interesting, like what he told us about Tartini, which I won't spoil here, um, but you can look it up. And uh, it's really fascinating history. And so in that same way, like I feel I often, I, should, I, I used to keep a list, and then it was depressing because the list was so long, and I never had time to really do the you can you can look up like real basic information but that's not really doing research right you you can look it up in a dictionary you can look it up in the in the new oxford right or or uh or your your trusty uh, musical terms dictionary sometimes has some nice information as well but that's not really doing research that's just kind of looking up a basic thing i want to really know like when was the first theme and variations and um you know, what did people write about it then? What was the reception history of it? That kind of stuff. That's really the deep stuff. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we could we could borrow. We, we certainly could borrow from other places. Um, uh, my, uh, my sister says iterating, iterative isn't exactly right, but we could borrow from visual art. And, um, yeah, we could, but there probably is a real term, like historically speaking, that we know. And it may be one of those ones that, fell out of favor, right? What did I just learn? Uh, uh, what did I just learn? What did I just learn? Um, there are there are a bunch of old, older English words that like were vying for competition at the same time. 
and the ones that we use today uh, are the ones that won out. But there are other ones that are still equally viable, and you could just start using them, and people would understand you because they still have a close enough relationship to the rest of our language. So I can't remember what it was, but it was something like wasn't, wasn't and, and wasn't or something, you know, where it's like, oh, that's close, but what did you say? And so I, it could be something like that. Anyway, all right. Let's try to play this whole variation now that I'm too cold to actually play it. But that was a good break. Thanks, guys. So good. Oh boy. Not so great on the second little part. We didn't practice enough, but we'll leave that for another day. I'm. This is. I'll show you my the part that I'm really frustrated about. Jousting. Jousting is good. Uh. College audition lists, and I'm wondering what pieces I should prioritize working on because of their difficulty. This is this is a great piece if you can play it, but this take this took me after way after college. I didn't look at this until I probably was five or six years into teaching college. Um, I would say this piece probably took me three years of looking at to really feel comfortable playing it, and then I still really kind of hacked through my first performance. I I mean I did fine, but it wasn't any more accurate than what I just played the whole way through, right? Um, so I wouldn't necessarily suggest this, but, um, you know, uh, Ted, to answer your question, um, I'll play some more too, um, but you want to play a nice variety of different things that is uh, relatively short, right? So that it shows off the, the variety part very quickly, um, and sort of without delay or any kind of extra parts that you don't need to, to do to show off the, the, the different things you can do, right? And uh, that is about as hard as you feel really comfortable playing. So in other words, don't go harder than you can play because that's a, that's a recipe for disaster on your audition. You want to go just up to the level where you say, I could do this under any amount of circumstances, under any pressure. And even if that's not very hard, right? That's, it's better to play something really beautifully and just impossibly perfect than it is to go and try to play something that is um, that is right on the bleeding edge of your ability level where you kind of get it and kind of don't, right? Um, now, that being said, if the variety includes some things that you do really perfectly and some things that you're still clearly working on, that's okay too. But it's best if you can sort of... I, I tell people in recitals to think about last year what they would have wanted to do that now seems like it's too easy. That's what you probably should do on your, your recital. So the same thing for auditions. Like, you want to do stuff that you know you can do really well. And so technique-wise, that's going to be stuff that you've been able to do for a while and not what you just learned. So we'll talk about it more in a second. Uh, if you have more comments or questions about it, then uh, uh, play, uh, while I play this third variation, uh, put them in the comments. And my dad is here, too. He can probably give you even better advice than I, than I will. But... Uh... is in a bad place when I can't do vibrato with color the way I want. It means I'm too I'm too open set. So the rest of this, like I said, it's going to waste me 
So I'm not going to play all of it. But it's a beautiful, beautiful variation. What we are going to do is we're going to skip basically a line. Um, So I want to, this is what I'm working on. Um, well, first of all, I think there's a wrong note here. Um, well, I just played a wrong note, actually. Um, but this note here, there's no, there's, there's no augmented second sound in the entire piece. Uh, in that in that kind of melodic way, except for here, and I think it sounds more correct. And I uh, this would be a great time to get the piano part out, except I don't know where it is in this very big pile. But um, to see what the what the sonority is there. But that's that's just a normal G minor. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, 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 Oh, sorry, that's a, what am I talking about? This is in C minor, so that's our, our G mixolydian um, scale, all right? Well, that's wrong, too. Um, it's our, sorry, it, yeah, it's our, it's our fifth mode melodic minor scale. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't know why it took me so long to figure that out. Um, fifth mode melodic minor, right? So it's our C minor scale starting on G, but melodic minor. And I think that he probably wouldn't put our harmonic minor in there in this case. So I'm going with melodic minor for now, but uh, I would need to check that. And I have a question mark in there already, but that's, this is a perfect example. I've had that question mark in there for seven years, and I've never once come to the conclusion. I probably even looked at the piano part and it didn't tell me, but... Maybe if I look now, I'll have more. Anyway, that's not what we're working on. We're working on, we want to get brighter as we go down, and then we want to go super dark. And that's going to give us this uh, uh, sudden, this sort of shocking uh, dynamic change here. So it's supposed to go... first valve's too long. So, but again, this horn is teaching me a lot of stuff. So you can hear, I want to get softer and brighter. It's really physically hard to hold that. But then I just, I just let everything go back, snap back to where is, is natural, and I get this nice dark C, right? I can really make a contrast there. It might, it might, it might be too much, but I'd rather be prepared to do too much and then back it off from there, and it's easier for me. All right, that's enough of that. We, everybody wants to hear the fourth variation, right? So let's do some of that. We've spent all of our time on these two pieces, but boy, is it a lot of there's a lot to do in here, right? So uh, there's this nice cadenza. I'm not going to play. It's it's a cadenza, and it sets up the fourth variation. But the piano really starts it. So again, another place where you better be prepared to play faster than you thought. The last time I did this piece, I can't remember even where it was. My dad might remember. If he's still here, uh, dad, tell me in the comments, where did I play this last? I can't, I literally can't remember. What I do remember is that whoever I was playing it with, uh, it, so it, it, most of the recordings kind of go, um, you know, right they kind of get into the tempo so they did that but they started at the tempo we agreed on so they went like 
I was like, oh no, this is, this is, um, not a good, not a good tempo for me. And so I just, I, I got through it. Okay. Um, cause I practiced it at a variety of tempos, but I just had to sort of go for it and trust myself. I, I, I couldn't, I, I trusted my fingers. I trusted my tongue and I just well, went on autopilot basically, uh, or, or killer instinct music, but not, I didn't try to make the fingers happen or the tongue happen because I, I knew that was a death sentence. So, and luckily, if you just focus on your air instead, or the music in this case, uh, it, it can work out as long as your technique is good. So uh, we want to, it might have been UK Summer Institute. I thought last, last year, last time I played Henza, right? Which I have my Henza memorabilia here in the room with me, by the way. But uh, maybe it was the summer before that, though. I just remember it went so stupid fast that I, like, I was just frantic at the end. And I don't remember really getting, like, any, you know, I didn't have a conversation with a pianist or anything afterwards. It just was over. And it's fine. Right. Anyway. Oh, you know, it could have been. Yeah, it could have been the Pittsburgh one. Gosh, would I have played it there though? What what did we do a recital? I thought we only played with bigger groups there. Anyway, I don't know. Let's practice it. Uh this one I'm gonna use a metronome for. Uh oh you can't you can't really. Oh no, you you can do it on the eighth note, right? So I've done this many times. So so it's it's sixty nine to the dotted quarter which means the eighth note, right, is 180 plus 27 is uh, 207, right? So there it is. That's fast. So we're going to go, we're going to, I know I've done this so many times, I know that I need to start at 180 at least. So here we go. Hmm. It's good. Most people practice that much because there's a page turn here and the page turn is doable. So you don't need to copy it. So we'll do that too. We're going to practice that much. Then we'll turn the page and practice the whole ending. This would be a good one to do with back backwards if you were learning it because the beginning is way easier than how the ending goes. The problem is you can't do the, the ending gets faster and faster. So you have to figure out how you're going to program that into, but we'll go 185. And we're going to try to clean it up every time, too, and make it softer. One of the things that's important to me is I don't want to get the articulations wrong at any tempo. And they're very tricky here because you have... Right? And then the second time we have Now does it matter when you're going super fast? Most people won't notice if you do it not not exactly right, but I want to do it right. It's just it's what it says. There's no excuse to not do it right except that I was lazy at some point in the process and I don't need to be lazy. It I guess it's okay if somebody sounds great and they didn't play exactly the right thing. I mean I'm still into that performance, but if I noticed 10 years from now that I recorded this piece perfectly, except I did the wrong articulations, then like, what, why didn't I just do the right articulations? Now, I, you know, now there's no, there's still, I still haven't recorded it really because I didn't do that. So I think it's important to be detail oriented that way. Um, other people don't agree with me and that's totally fine. I still love their recordings, but I just think that's, that's not that hard to do as long as you build it in from the beginning. And then if there's a reason you can't do it, like, well, I just can't triple tongue that fast or I just, you know, but I still wanted to play the piece. Well, that's okay then. That's, you're admitting that it's, it's something that you wish you could do, but you just can't yet. But that's not any excuse to not hear this beautiful music at, at some level of detail, right? So I think that's a good compromise. Anyway, uh, 190, let's try. 
See if we can do it. Ah, see, I got it wrong. Let's do all of that again. stuck there. So I do, um, on this piece, I do all single tongue, so right, and then and instead of trying to go, because that's always, that's stutter, stutter tongue for me. Although, uh, talking to Joe yesterday, he would probably do it all single tongue there. Right, so that it has that sort of firm ending, uh, which I, I wish I could do. I, I'm, maybe I should try it, because I agree with him on that. Um, but I just, I, I can't quite single tongue. So I go, which is the cleanest one that I can do. Um, and the same... Da, 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 ka, da, da. Da, ka, da, da. Right? That's the cleanest one that I feel like I can do at this speed. Um, anyway. All right. 190 is still not really super clean. Let's try to put it in little pieces. Still kind of not getting into that C. So that's the kind of thing you have to do is take it out of context. Instead of trying to do it three times in a row and then go on when you get it or not do it a hundred times in a row, but just a little piece of it so that that goes well every time. So um, I should play a bunch of this. I, like I said, I don't want to spend all day on one piece, but I, I would and I probably should if I'm going to play this really well. But let's, let's play it down. Let's play it without the metronome for now so I can have a little bit of leeway, uh, if you'll excuse me. And, um, and I just finish off on this, uh, uh, on this French Besson. Um, in fact, let's... I know we, it's a bad time to switch mouthpieces, right? Because I just built it in on the, the other one. But this is, my, this is my New York 7 that's a little bit later. It's a little bit uh, like more open, but it has a, a bitier spot on it. And that might help. I'm all over the place on this. <clears throat> Let's keep going though. Just get I, I just want you to hear it a little bit. I'll have to practice all this later. there that the main theme coming back right bum, 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 bum. that's the best part all right 
So it's all right. I didn't like this mouthpiece any better. Um, and I, 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 what I'm really happening, what's really happening to me now is I'm, I'm after my point of concentration where I really should just stop. So if anybody has questions, I can answer those a little more casually without concentrating. And I'm starting to get tongue tied because I'm not keeping my air going. My production is starting to suffer because I'm not, I'm concentrating on, well, you can't concentrate on many things. That's not what concentrating means, right? So I'm concentrating on too many things, which really means I'm not concentrating on anything. And so all of it's falling apart, right? And that's a good time to just put it away either for the day or for the hour or for the, for the next five minutes or just any amount of time where you give yourself a mental break. So ask me questions about stuff. Uh, I think, yeah, dad, I think it was, I think it was UK Trumpet Institute two years ago. But, I, but the pianist would have been Robert, I think, right? And well, no, that's not his name. Maybe it is. Uh, and he was really good. I mean, he would have nailed the tempos. I don't think it was, I don't think it was him anyway. And I've only ever played one other thing with anybody else. And that pianist I didn't need to play with because I played unaccompanied. So I think it must have been Kansas. Yeah, I think it was the Kansas, uh, which is a great, uh, Can the Kansas Pittsburgh State um, Trumpet Festival is amazing. Uh, Todd always has uh, really great guest artists. And it's not even the headliners always that are the reason you go, right? Like when, um, when me and my dad went there, I'm, I was more excited to go for everybody else who was there to, to meet them and hear them play, right? Uh, the recitalists were incredible and they're all, you know, sort of faculty there, uh, for the camp. But, um, but you know, the, the, the three of us were on the poster, uh, and I, I was more excited about the, the people who weren't on the poster in that case. Right. So it was, uh, I learned a lot that time. And as a matter of fact, I made some really good friends. So it's always nice. Uh, no, see, I, yeah, that's what I was saying. Uh, Robert Cheater, I think, would have gotten the tempo just nails. So I don't think I played it with him. I played it with somebody else some other time. I just, you know, this is this is one of those ones where you play, you, you know, you do enough gigs. And then also, like, the pandemic, I we haven't done the norm any for, for a year now. And so... It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of, did that happen to me? Did I play this piece once or did I just dream that, you know? So luckily I haven't, I haven't started having dreams uh, with masks or anything yet. Uh, at least not that I remember. But um, anyway, yeah, uh, I don't remember. Now I may never, I may never remember. You know, I should be able to look it up because I keep a pretty solid CV now. Uh, I might have... I, usually I don't write down what I played at the event, though, is the problem. But I'm, I probably have the programs filed away somewhere and, and uh, in, the, in a pile over there that need to be scanned. So I'll probably find out soon because I have to scan all of my physical documents in because my uh, tenure portfolio is going to be digital. For the first time, I will be the test run of the digital portfolio. So we'll see how that goes. I have all my stuff, so it shouldn't be a problem. But it just means I have to sit down and... I have to sit at a scanner for probably four or five days just going scan. Nope, that one sucked. Scan again. All right. Oh, this this is too big for the scanner pictures, you know. So anyway, there's Scarlatti Beach, uh, B Scarlatti. I'm, I'm, I'm always going to say it wrong. It's fine. Um, <clears throat> so while I while I rest a little bit, still no questions, huh? Well, we're down to four people. That's, that makes sense. This piece is the one I want to try next. This is called Krill by Robert Erickson. And uh, let's, say, let's just say it's a departure from what we were just doing. And there's just a section of it that I haven't played in a long time that I used to be really good at, that I, I had really under my fingers at one point. And it's just this part where you, uh, you play a duet with yourself, basically. 
Yeah, or a trio, rather. But you play a trio with yourself. So I could play some of the different sounds in this, probably. Um, and don't worry, if, if you're like, oh no, it's all crazy, it's back to, back to 20th century theory for Gabriel. No, we're not going to analyze this piece. Um, it's, it's, it's already hard enough. It's not that you shouldn't uh, analyze it, but it's, it's not going to have any kind of interesting analysis the way that we might have. It's, it's a, this is a quarter tone piece, and so it's already defying our 12 tone systems. So we're not going to be able to do any of our traditional techniques to analyze it. It's mostly going to be a rhythmic, um, sort of a, a, a different kind of pitch class content analysis that is, is, I think, pretty obvious on the page. So it's not a matter of doing that deep level of uh, arithmetic, so to speak. It's more about just learning the, the extended techniques and being able to play lyrically while you play this crazy stuff. So, all right, well, if you guys are not going to ask me any questions, I guess I'm just going to start playing again. Oh, we still we left our mute in there. That's also a bad habit. Don't leave your mutes in your trumpets because uh, the moisture stays built up in there and you can... You can get some damage to the inside of your horn. So, all right. So this piece, uh, we have to get, we have to get some ground rules. There's, there's a, there's six pages of rules to this piece, and I think I'm, I think I know them all. Um, let's see if I do. Right. So let's make sure. So what, the way that this works, if you're watching, is you're going to use alternate fingerings. So, in it, for instance, if I'm playing a C, right, right, then I can also play it, right. But the value of putting the second and third valve down for C instead of open is that when I move the third valve, it lengthens the entire trumpet, right? It lengthens that that uh, that length of tubing. So I can play in between C, but I can still have C by itself. So I can play C and B. And then I can play C this way, but in between C and B, right? So that's the way that we're, this is all working. So, what's in between? Well, the quarter tone. to play this much softer but we're gonna we're gonna sort of work our way towards from the beginning towards the uh part that i need to know that, that i want to work on uh this i need to work on the whole piece but i want you to see if you're if you're hanging out and this is just kind of in the background while you're doing i don't know your homework or your laundry or maybe you're actually practicing and you're just taking a break or maybe you're playing video games because you're on twitch and you're just kind of watching while you load into the next planet that you're going to or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, this, I want you to sort of be introduced to the soundscape of this piece before we get into the really crazy stuff. So, oh boy. That's wrong. That's a hard one. Yeah, and you, you actually really should adjust each of these. So we could even use a, metro, or a, t a tuner. Why not? Right? If we really want to get stupid. Uh, oops. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I won't, I won't have it plugged in, uh, but it'll be on the stand. So here's our C, right? Trumpet, uh, trumpet trivia question bot for the breaks is a great idea. Yeah, Dad can help. Dad, send Catherine an email with a bunch of trumpet trivia. Yeah, that was actually pretty close. That's... That sounds terrible if, to your modern ear, right? So I didn't promise it wouldn't be terrible. I promised it wouldn't be an analysis. Um, so 
that's it's only about a centimeter of my third valve. It seems like it should be more, but because we're using alternate fingerings that are often flat, it's not as much. Now, it, it'll get worse, but it's it's really hard to try to adjust it exactly. So I can I can work that out later, but right now the hardest part, the, the, the thing that's in the way for me is being able to do the, the ultra chromatic scale, right? Which is what we're kind of doing. So yeah, I, that, that's what's called uh, delegation. When you're like, that's a great idea that I don't have time to do, then you just ask somebody else nearby to do it. And if they say, okay, then it's great. And if they say no, it, well, it wasn't their job anyway. So thanks dad and thanks Catherine. Now is this a, these are some, these are some of the worst uh, slur markings I've ever seen in this piece. I never noticed this before, but it's like, it's like a, it's like somebody wrote it with a, with a, like they had too much coffee that day and they just kind of scribbled it, you know, which I, I mean, I, I, that's me most days, but I wouldn't publish the piece like that. I don't think, but anyway, I'm, it's nice that it's handwritten. singing involved right so you thought it was crazy earlier now we've got to sing in between notes on pitch and really it should be higher than that let's see singing is pretty bad but now some people sing this up an octave and I'm not sure why uh, but also people some people sing it in their co more comfortable range which is down an octave which I think maybe that's why uh, that other people are overcompensating for the recordings that they've heard and they think oh that's uh, octaves are a funny thing some people don't hear in the proper octave very well and and maybe I'm one of them maybe I'm getting it an octave too low right now uh, I don't know but it seems like it's the right so Let's see if I can do this whole line. turn the tuner off now so tell me that's not crazy right I got most of those I a lot of its muscle memory with your vocal cords it's real weird 
Um, and so, yeah, we've got now the, the sounds that we've got, right? Let's, let's overview real quick. We've got this sort of... Right? We've got the ultra chromatics. Then we've got... Oh, sorry. A single pedal G, that's what I'm trying to play there. Right, so I'm playing a little out of time, but that's... So singing in between almost every note now, and pedal tones, those are the sounds. So ultra chromatic, singing, pedal tones. And half valve gliss we did once, but... You know, maybe not enough to call it a sound yet. Now we get double pedal tones. Yeah. So we had... And... And... And now... I can't really do it. You're supposed to be able to do it with just your top lip. I can almost do it with my bottom lip. It just sounds like nothing. So I've got to work on my double pedal G. So there's now a new sound, which is scream. Let's just play single pedal. Sounds real forced when I do it. I should sing better. That's about as close as I'm going to get to not forced. It's still pretty bad. right uh au revoir oh <laughs> all right see you dad um poor montana i assume that means for for practice i don't know i don't speak french you do i speak german well i don't speak anything i'm i'm enough to read it i can do it Au revoir pour maintenant. That's a good rhyme, though. I hope it is. See you later to practice. Anyway, so there's a bunch more of this. We do get the half valve again. So we can count that as a sound. But now, now it gets exciting. Because we're going to take our first valve out. Uh, and we're going to bring... Oh, right. Uh, we've been using our third valve out a little bit, so he's saying, you don't need to do that anymore. Don't worry about that. We're not going to do any of those sounds in this section. So now, now get ready for some serious multi-sounds, right? I'm going to sing. I'm going to do... So now we have the valve not in there. So when I push down the first valve, right, I can play... As long as I don't touch the first valve, and as soon as I do... Right? It's, it's through this instead of through the bell, which is cool. But then when you combine it with other valves, because the, the, the air pattern goes through these valves before it gets to this valve at all, I can actually play other pitches than just what comes out naturally. Right? So this is where it gets cool. Oh, 
That's my favorite part. I don't know why, but it's just so cool that you get to you do the scream. It's not over yet. I have to sing now, but I just like how that he 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 knew we're going away, we're going up, and then let's make that last note like far away muted sound, right? Very cool. So anyway, let's actually work on it. I, this isn't how I would work on it. I'm just now I'm just excited showing you stuff. But so the first thing is it's supposed to be an F sharp. And actually, let's look this up. In the beginning, so there's an arrow. What I have is an arrow underneath the F sharp, which I think maybe he's saying bring it up to be an F sharp, but I think it's already sharp. So either that's a mistake. The vertical arrows above or below notes indicate the direction, but not the degree of microtonal deviation from the usual tuning system. So, oh, it's giving me permission to be out of tune. Excellent. I love that. is the kind of stuff you have to practice it has all the fingerings written out yeah i'll show you it has all the fingerings written on it put it put it where you can see it that's yeah, kind of there we go yeah you can see it has all the fingerings on the page for every note almost but and that's still you're now you're looking at the note the fingerings this is why fingerings in music doesn't really work because now you're just looking at fingerings instead of notes and you really need to be playing by ear the problem with this is that you can't play traditional, like, how, how could you have practiced these fingerings for these sounds? Well, you, you couldn't, but that's what the whole beginning is for, right? You've got these crazy, not correct sounds and fingers going together, so it's kind of absolving you of your norm of playing by ear. And now you get this section, but now as a, that's great for the listener and that's great for the piece. That's not so great for the performer because you still got to learn a new set of fingerings for this set of notes. Now you could go around all day going, well, what's the fingering for that? You know, oh, okay. Uh, oh. 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 Right, you could try to figure out every note so that you know the muted sound and the regular fingering and the voice all together, and that's not a bad abstract exercise, but you could also just learn these four lines really very slowly and clearly, and you never have to know other notes in this situation. So this is a good just do it kind of scenario, right? Uh, so where were we just now? Uh, here we go. second valve wants to stick now because it's getting a little it's getting a little um dry being the last sort of point of uh departure for the air before it goes into the first valve and goes out of the horn so i'm just going to put a little on it there because the last thing you want is also a valve problem when you're trying to do crazy valve combinations so i don't know if this is an interesting somebody say Hey, you know, I mean, just put a, put a request in there. I'll, I'll do whatever you want. Um, but here we go. Oh. So this I've practiced a million hours. I do like for these A's to be in tune, even though he says it's okay to have a little bit of deviation uh, on, on the, the one, two, and three A. I actually like to keep them all the same as close as possible. And I'm gonna have some deviation anyway, right? I can't control it. So it's still what he says. It's, it says not the degree, right? So if I just a little microtonal, that's okay. But I really like that you get three tones of the same A back and forth here. Um, after a sound that, 
is pretty surprising in the piece, which is a loud breath, right? <gasps> which, I mean, that's how my interpretation, I guess you could go, <sighs> but I, I think it's more of a, a gasp, right? So, up, 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 up. Pretty crazy things to hear in the background if you are still doing work, but I think it's, I think this is the most fun kind of practice to do, so I'm going to keep doing it. to practice this so much so it's oh. Oh. it's all in it's five over four right see why this takes a long time to learn, right? Pretty ideal, actually. Yeah, well, I'm glad it's working for somebody. Um, yeah, it's. I think it's actually, if I can play it better, it's really beautiful music, honestly. It's, it's fairly tonal, which uh, I know most, as much as it's microtonal before, the overall piece is really pretty straight ahead tonal, at least up until now. Um, yeah, let's see if we can get through it and we'll go a little further. This might be a good place to stop the stream soon. Ah. Oh. I'm making the same mistakes. Let's go slower. not bad actually for a, a run through of the section it's supposed to be 320 to the 16th note and these are the 16th notes that we just went so let's see what that is i can't go 320 but dun, and dun, 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 dun. so uh 320 is 160 right so so we're not even close right like 160 Oh, sorry. All right, I mean, it's fast. So right now we're at about half tempo. Maybe a little faster than half, but that's fine. So now what I get to do is leave my valve out, and now we're going to do some even more crazy stuff. Oh, oh, oh. there he goes. Uh -huh, oh boy. And this is a, this is one you really need to copy. In fact, they probably have the copies here, but we'll just do it page by page. Uh, uh, 
actually, I didn't change. I gotta, uh, let's mark that. This is a good circle opportunity. The change is right there. So I go. Let's see, what is that? That's right. That's it. Uh, uh, yeah. gets I've never worked on this enough this is where it gets really hard to do at all because you're okay I'll, I'll, I'll break it down for you here's what you're supposed to be doing right you're supposed to be being able to go all going right it's really like constant 16th same tempo as before um way too hard for me to do today and probably not interesting to hear me hack through it but this is this this is the kind of piece people spend 10 years on before they play it live and i only know a few people who who do it uh brit toyer my predecessor here at ecu uh being one of the best at this particular piece um and probably still is to this day I mean, it's just, it takes so long to learn it and so much just attention to sounds uh, and, and figuring out how to do them. I mean, it's not, it's, this is not the Tomasi where you just play the notes and that's it. And that's a hard piece. This is now, now play the Tomasi, but with even less tonality and sing in between every other note and also do these extended techniques like take a valve out and... Uh, play through the vented valve, and uh, how about pedal tone, double pedal tone. Later on in this piece, we get uh, ingressive uh, vocal fry. Where is it? Glottal fry, ingressive, right? This is another spot where, where our, uh, our valve is still out. We never put it back, all right? And you do all these, you're, you're, you're doing the... You know, you, you play for a little while on the trumpet and then and then here we get it's just a it's like a double pedal F written, but it's really just an X notation. Uh glottal fry and aggressive. So what do you do? Well the fry is right? Uh, uh, but inside, uh, it's really just the worst thing. And I don't know if I can do it through the... I can't really do it. <clears throat> I used to be able to get it pretty good. And usually I just do an ex exhale glottal fry um, because I can make it louder, but... <laughs> it's just not the kind of thing. I mean... It's just a bunch of noises, but boy, when you hear them all put together, I wish I could do it for you. Maybe someday. If you stick with this stream for 14 more years, I promise to do it. And somebody, somebody right now is on the stream and it's going to be like, I'm writing that down. Let me get my Google Calendar out. 15, 14 years from today, uh, March 26th or whatever it is, I'm going to hold him to that. So that'd be fine. Just a, but gave, maybe give me a reminder like five years from now so I can at least make sure I get started on it. Um, all right. 
So we're going to finish out with a little bit of piccolo trumpet. And let's see. We're going to play a little bit of Molter. Because uh, uh, why? Well, um, I want to play more piccolo. I, I've been playing a lot with my students in their lessons. And that's been great. Because a couple of them are doing Tartini. And uh, one of them is doing a Handel piece. Um, I shouldn't say it like that. I don't say Handel. I say Handel. Whatever. You say what you want. I'll say what I want. Um, it's because my student brought up, which way do you say it? And I said, they're both fine. And then I got confused. So anyway, <clears throat> I want to play Molter because I really love the Molter. Uh, this is the first concerto. And um, I actually I wanted to play this for my audition here at ECU, but I couldn't because I didn't have a piano part to it. Is that right? Or did I actually play it and I did have a piano part to it? And the other one was, yeah, I do have a piano part to this one. So I must have played this one and not, what didn't I play then? I, there was a different piece that I only had string scores to that I wanted to play. But anyway, this one is good too. So let's get into the piccolo before we just blast our face off. After all that crazy, uh, extended technique takes it out of you because you're not, you can't be physically set up as easily as well as you should be to play all that stuff. You should still maintain the same physical stature that you normally play with, but it's just really easy to get blown out of it because you're singing and you're, you're taking your mouthpiece off and putting it back on and taking one lip out and putting it back in. And so it's very easy to play not so well on extended techniques pieces. So. That's all right, I guess. So I have to play Brandenburg uh, in May. It looks like I'm going to get to do that. And so I want to play more piccolo up until May, uh, sort of increasing little by little every day, every week, until I feel really confident that Brandenburg is just going to fly out of my horn like no problem. So instead of starting with Brandenburg today, which is probably what I would have done 10 years ago, um, I thought I'd just play... I want to play nice melodies for fun that are still challenging, but maybe in little little smaller chunks. This is a long piece with not a lot of rest in it, so I'm not going to play it down. But I just want to I just want to enjoy playing piccolo and try to make my best sounds with my easiest production, right? So. too easy. It came out, but I sort of forced it out. And this may not be the best mouthpiece for me to play this stuff on anymore. It's a little bit shallow now, but <clears throat> let's see if we can get it better. I'm, I'm missing high on that A every time, even though I'm playing at third valve. That means my lips are getting too tight or are getting crushed. <clears throat> so it's good to even that out. You, you heard I did a, a scale. despite having played more since the first time I tried to play it, that was so much more centered and, and nice and easy and even, right? And it wasn't, I, I liked this about yesterday's masterclass too. Joe said, uh, it's not easy to play the trumpet. It's that you're willing to do the work that it takes to make it sound easy. And I thought that was a really interesting way to put it. I do try to make things as easy as possible, but he's right about that, that like easy as possible 
means that it always works and that feels easy to your ear, right? Even though your body's doing actually quite a bit of work. So in this case, I calibrated it better um, and I, I kind of let my body find the best place for it and whatever that means, probably a little bit lower back of the tongue, a little bit higher middle of the tongue, something like that. And then it came out. And what I didn't do is keep crushing it out, like I'm gonna make it come out. No, I just let it find its place, right? Let's keep going. So I knew that was gonna happen, but I'd rather it come out cacked like that than make it, right? So. I did a little Tim step there for those of you who know what that is. Oh, my other stream. One of my streams keeps going down. I wonder which one. If anybody having a problem with their stream, and if so, please tell me which one you're on. So we're starting to get a place where things work even if they don't work every time. And after two hours of playing, I'm okay if it doesn't work every time, but I'm glad to be able to find it. And like I said, I wanna step this up so that by the end of uh, next month, like the, by the end of April, I should be able to ice anything on the piccolo trumpet after two hours, no problem. But I need to regain that familiarity I, I've had with it before. So. chunks this is okay it's really easy for me to get that raspy sound though which is that's why i was saying there's not enough room in the mouthpiece to get away with anything so on a piece like this i might not play this on brandenburg on the other hand i need every little bit of help i can get to play all the high g's and double high a's and things and it's also a half step shorter right it's b flat piccolo so uh, i'm going to leave it alone i am going to have water though <clears throat> All right. Huh, let's see. getting into the kind of groove of where that F belongs without cacking it, without getting it, you know. Uh, I'm also going way too slow, but I just am trying to make sure I get the playing right. I don't care about getting all the notes. I'm not playing this piece tomorrow. <clears throat> so let's keep going. I'll go a little faster. This part, this maybe I can get the flow to it uh, better if I go a little faster, right? starting to lose it <clears throat> so we get we get a little recap uh, or I should say double exposition in this sense it's not really sonata form yet though so we get a, a retelling of the initial statements of some sort let's say that generically the adagio is so nice I'm gonna try to play a little bit of it you don't usually get to play in an adagio <clears throat> because they're usually in a minor key uh, and you just rest through it because tr Baroque trumpets couldn't play many of the notes in a, in a minor key, and they certainly couldn't play like tonic two, three, four, or something, right, in the minor key without recrooking. And even then, it would be probably out of tune or it would not be the correct third, so you'd have to skip it. 
Um, in this case, he does a really beautiful job of um, picking some notes that you could play. So it also helps that it's not a minor adagio, at least not the whole thing. But it's good, to, it's good to go up to that edge and then see if we can move that goalpost out a little bit tomorrow. This, it's actually a really long adagio, to be honest. The, the allegro at the end is also sort of anticlimactic. I remember this. I played the first two movements, and I really didn't need to play the second movement during my audition here. Uh, it just was too long, and I started to lose it. But... Um, I didn't, I didn't play the third movement because it's just not very interesting compared to the other two, right? I'll play a little bit. Yeah, endings and notes are hard on the shallow mouthpiece, but I'm starting to get into the horn better. So like, what's that about? And then you don't really play anything more interesting. That's it. That's a whole piece, basically. I mean, there's a couple of cadential trills later. It, I don't know. It's just, it seems like a bad third movement to me compared to the other really epic first and second movements. So anyway, yeah, there, there's a little bit of Molter. So uh, it's 508. Let's think about this. Okay, I've got a bad idea. Um, I got two bad ideas. Let's go with this one. So uh, I was gonna play a little bit of Fisher Toll Rhapsody, but it does take it out of you and I'm already out of it. What I instead will do is still play a shallow mouthpiece on a B flat trumpet, which will still sound maybe not the best, but <clears throat> And it'll feel definitely not the best. But what I'm going to play instead is Feel of a Vision, which is a Chuck Mangione tune that was written for uh, his lead trumpet player at the time, uh, whose name is going to escape me just because I'm trying to think of it. I have that thing, Anomia. You can look it up. But um, it's a great piece. And uh, it's, it's a little bit, it's light, right? It's Chuck Mangione. It's not super heavy, either for jazz or for classical. Let me move these mics a little bit too, sorry. Um, but it's got this really hard beginning, like bad interval at the beginning, and I'd like to be able to do that without crushing my lip when I'm tired. So this is a good time. This is, this is one of the things that if you're a trumpet player, if you're, if you're one of the three people listening are, are still a trumpet player that is interested in doing stuff like this, you don't want to test yourself a lot, right? Uh, like you don't make yourself tired on purpose and then put your shallow mouthpiece in and then try to just grip it and rip it. But what you do want to see is if you're able to keep your uh, production, the, way that, the best way of playing, can you keep that together at the end of the day on different equipment, right? So, and playing different things. So this will be a good, this, it is sort of a test, but it's, it's a test I'm willing to bail on at any time, right? I'm not going to make that high E flat come out at the beginning of this piece. I'm going to see if I can get it the way I know it should come out. And then I'm going to get used to that. And that's what's going to end up being ultimately my, my really, if I'm, if I'm ever to have incredible endurance, 
it will be because of this, not because I'm so strong, right? So it's a, it, endurance is coordination more than strength, and then the strength helps you stay coordinated. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use my strength to stay coordinated despite my lip feeling a little bit tired and my shallow mouthpiece being there. Oh, yeah. All right. Here we go. You'll, you may recognize this piece if you know any Chuck Man Jones stuff. And I, I haven't practiced in a long time, so it's going to be kind of rough. some stuff and then they come in and it says uh jazz three feel which is just uh, a waltz basically right oh boy it's not the note i thought that's one of the most important parts when your ear doesn't hear it and you go for it you're you're not in the right spot and that's deadly when you're tired or in a shallow mouthpiece or both there's our pitch right that F sharp. I knew it was because I knew it was a uh, diminished scale, but okay. here sorry oh it's my second valve stem oh sorry i can't believe i remembered that i don't remember how this ends it might be bad for me oh yeah it is bad I'm getting wrong. Yeah, see, that was the spot. I, I didn't hear any of that, and I just crushed my lip to get it. Bad, bad, bad. But we're doing okay. Coordination-wise, as long as I hear it, I'm doing fine. When I don't hear it, that's when I start... You can hear, you can see my furrowed brow go, stop, but I can't see it. So if I was looking in a mirror, I would, I would see that and go, don't play this. So play in a mirror, I guess, is the, 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 uh, or sing it first is what I tell my students. And that's what I really should be doing. Okay, let's try it. Close enough. 
close enough, I guess, for, for now. It's hard to remember that F sharp. It's not always in, in the ear the way it needs to be. Oh, this is the rock part. Let's play this slow. Yeah, I guess it wasn't so hard. And then we've got a lot of repeated stuff with what we do. Uh, then we've got a lot of slow, long notes, which I probably should play, but I know that's a bad, that's not going to happen today uh, at this point. I mean, we could try some of it and see how far we get. Let's try that. Um, what tempo is it? I don't know this part off the top of my head. so close to getting the end of that line but you I, I don't know if you can't tell this on the stream but I'm not pressing on my face more than just the normal like that's what it takes to play those notes if I pressed a little harder I could make sure these notes come out but then you're gonna see me angle up and then I, I'm I'm in danger of, of damaging that top lip so um, that's let's not do that let's look at the ending that's what everybody wants to hear right how does this how does this piece end uh, let's see it. So we go back to the 160. Oh, this is a really bad lick. So. It's not as bad as I thought. That's only that's that's the easy part of the lick, by the way. Let's see. So if we're going, let's see. One, two, three. That, this that's impossible. I'll have to listen to this. Uh, I, there's a recording of this on YouTube right now, as a matter of fact, of the guy that I can't think of his name. I can't believe I forgot it. It's a famous lead trumpet player. I just can't remember. Okay, let, let's just look at the intervals of the ending. Because there, the, the, there's three, four bars there that are just super fast, bad technical things. And I want to hear, if I hear them, then if they're really just like jazz licks, I can, I can pick them up without trying to read this and try to interpret what, how it's supposed to sound just play it to me and I'll play it back to you. You know, sometimes these transcriptions are not easy to read that way. Right, some of that. And there's your ending. So uh, well, we played high notes, we played loud, we played piccolo, we played a lot of 
crazy beeps and bops and boops and singing and um, stuff like that. We played Fets for like an hour and, uh, and Scarlatti uh, variations uh, by Biche. Uh, so lots of hard stuff today. We didn't quite get to uh, Fisher Toll Rhapsody. What else did I have on the docket? Was that it? Yeah, I think we got to everything else. So that's pretty good. And I don't know what I would have done with Fisher Toll anyway. I need to, I was going to learn the cadenza at the end, um, but it was going to be a lot of singing, very difficult intervals on a, and then playing them on a shallow mouthpiece. So that might be a good thing to do at, like maybe I sing a lot of it before the stream and then I do a little singing and playing uh, at the beginning of a stream. So anyway, uh, stay tuned for, well, don't literally stay tuned. Come back next week and we'll, I believe it'll be, I have to take a break the week after that, but um, yeah, maybe we'll have some people play. I would love that. So thanks for joining me again. And um, let me know if you have any questions, any comments, uh, if you want to play, anything like that. And uh, thanks everybody for coming by. I'll see you next week.